Good morning, everybody. Uh, wonderful to see everybody. My name is Nancy Lindborg. I'm the president of the US Institute of Peace. And I'm delighted to welcome everybody who's here with us today and those of you who are watching online um, to this sixth uh, in a series of bipartisan congressional dialogues here at US Institute of Peace. We launched this series earlier this year um, to provide a platform for members of Congress who are working from opposite sides of the aisle on uh, really on critical issues with the goal of advancing our national security interests. And this is the bipartisan spirit, actually, that was at the founding of U.S. Institute of Peace when Congress founded us in 1984 with the distinct mission of preventing and resolving violent conflict abroad. Um, and we believe that a world without violent conflict is possible that it is practical, and it is, of course, essential for our national security. And we pursue our mission by working with partners around the world, uh, practical applications of, of the best ways to prevent and resolve violent conflict, and also by hosting events like this to advance the policy discussions. And we're honored to have with us here today Two great friends, uh, strong supporters of USIP, Congressman Chris Stewart from Utah and Congressman Dutch Ruppersberger from Maryland. Um, both congressmen uh, are leaders on foreign policy and national security in, uh, issues in Congress. Congressman uh, Stewart is a member of the House Permanent Select Committee on Intelligent. Congressman Ruppersberger was previously the ranking committee on this member as well. Both are members of the House Appropriations State Foreign Operations and Related Program subcommittees. So they are deeply engaged in these critical issues and very knowledgeable. Um, at USIP, we strongly believe that fostering bipartisan efforts to strengthen national security are critical. And we found that despite what you're reading in the papers, there is a strong, genuine effort on the Hill to advance these critical issues um, uh, for our national security. And so today, our conversation will focus on managing conflict and competition with China, which is especially given this week's headlines, a very timely topic. Um, yesterday, we heard President Trump accuse the Chinese government of attempting to interfere in the midterm elections. Um, earlier this week, the administration implemented an additional $200 billion in tariffs on Chinese imports. Um, so we're seeing that confrontation with China, competition with China, is a topic of increasing interest and concern. We saw in the national security strategy of the Trump administration that there was an increased emphasis on the need to address the return of great power competition. Um, we have seen that China is flexing its muscle increasingly on the world stage, increased investments in Asia and in Africa, um, and they play an active role in countries that are struggling with internal and now internationalized conflict. So understanding their role in these conflicts and understanding the nature of the competition is really essential. Um, this year, USIP has been convening a series of bipartisan senior study groups to examine China's role uh, in conflict dynamics around the world. The first study group uh, looked at China's significant and complicating role in Burma's many conflicts, including the really terrible tragedy in Rakhine. Their work just wrapped up this week, or last week, uh, with the launch of their final report. There are copies uh, as you exit, and I also urge you to look for it online. And the second group has just begun, which is now focusing on China's role vis-a-vis -vis the, the uh, nuclear threat of North Korea. Um, so there are... Uh, these are issues that are very much at the top of our agenda here at USIP, and we are delighted to be able to probe more deeply into some of these issues with two foremost congressional uh, leaders uh, who will discuss with us today how the Hill is thinking about and approaching th these critical issues. Um, before we begin, I want to invite all of you to follow USIP on Twitter, at USIP, and join in today's conversation with the hashtag BipartisanUSIP. Um, we will 
end uh, our conversation with an opportunity for questions from uh, those of you in the audience and online. Uh, we'll be passing out note cards, so grab one. If you have a question, we'll be collecting those and adding those to the conversation. And with that, please join me in welcoming to the stage Congressman Stewart and Congressman Ruppersberger. Gentlemen. No, we'll go to the seats. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, gentlemen, thank you very much for joining sure. us. And uh, Congressman Stewart, I would like to ask you to open us up if you'd like to okay. join us. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, Nancy, you, thank you. It's an honor to be with you. Um, and have all of you here. Uh, and there, I want you to know there's no one that I respect more than my friend Dutch. He and I have traveled together. He's a former ranking member on the Intel Committee, which I spend a lot of my time on. Uh, and it's an honor to be here. Um, as some of you know, I was a former Air Force pilot. And I'm, we could fly 17, 20-hour missions. I could hit my target plus or minus one second. So you said five minutes opening oh boy. comments here. Uh, I've started my mm -hmm. clock, and I will be plus or minus one second okay. on this. We'll see. Mm -hmm. um, I'm asked all the time, what's it like to be in Congress? And, uh, and I used to tell people, and still do, if you want to know what it's like to be in Congress, go over here and bang your head against that wall about 12 <laughs> times, mm -hmm. and then go home and get yelled at, right? Mm -hmm. And I'll go home and people will be like, hey, why are you doing this? Why aren't you doing this? You're a bad congressman. And, uh, and that's just my family you know? <laughs> <laughs> and my friends, uh, which is why th these kind of events are important to me, because it doesn't have the same sense of frustration, the same sense of angst that we feel, uh, and that so many people feel, regardless of where you are in the political spectrum. We have uh, two people here that are uh, you know, Republicans and Democrats, and yet we understand that these issues that USIP and others are, are so strong in advocating for matter, and that by and large, they should be and have been, and we must continue for them to be bipartisan in nature. It's just too important otherwise. Uh, so I'll go home and bang my head against the wall on these other issues, but in this case, I don't have to do that, and I'm grateful for that. Um, setting the stage now for about China and this issue and national security in general, I had an interesting conversation with Admiral Harris, who used to be the PACOM commander. Uh, as in that role, he had almost a third of all military forces fell under his command. He's now the uh, ambassador in Korea. I saw him a few weeks ago. Uh, and he was taken to Korea for the very, very specific purpose of what he could do to help with, obviously, the denuclearization of North Korea, a very important mission. But he said something, and I think he articulated it well, and when he asked, you know, what is the greatest threat facing our country? Or what are the greatest challenges we had? And he said, North Korea is the most imminent challenge, the most ur urgent. He said, the Soviet, not Soviet Union, Russia, uh, former Soviet Union, is the most, is the only existential threat that we face. But China is the most complicated. And I think, I think that's true. Uh, you know, this is something that um, we were talking earlier, and, and, uh, and I said, as a young lieutenant, uh, you know, flying jets or flying combat rescue helicopters at the time, we were fully prepared and expecting to be at war with Russia as they came through the fold gap in Germany. And I think. Cold War. During the Cold War, that's right. I mean, it was Russia, it was the Soviet Union at that time. And, and we have to generationally change our thinking now. I, I wrote an editorial a couple of weeks ago where we said we have to change our thinking to realize that China is the greatest threat that we face from a national security perspective and, and from other perspectives as well, including an economic perspective. And one of the foundations for that has to be this, and that is one of the other great threats that we face. And I was asked this recently, and I just come back from Moscow, and I said, it's that no one knows what is true anymore. And, and that's this kind of overlap to this. We have to be able to, to deal with this issue in an honest way when we actually have data and it's not just emotion. And, uh, and I think that's the foundation for dealing with, frankly, anything, but particularly this one. Um, and I'll maybe end, end with this. Um, I had, I had, uh, had a chance to have dinner the other night with uh, John Bolton, the National Security Advisor, and we spent some time talking about a number of things. And he's a fascinating man, and he's as knowledgeable on national security generally as anyone that I know. 
And, you know, regardless of what you think about this president, I think one thing that we can agree on, and that is he has assembled an, an extraordinary team. Mike Pompeo, a friend of mine from Intel Committee, General Mattis, Nikki Haley, these are extraordinary individuals on national security. And, and the National Security Advisor and I had this conversation, what is the greatest threat that we face? What, are, what keeps you awake at night? Where do we concentrate our efforts? And, you know, you talk about proliferation in North Korea, the denuclearization. You talk about Vladimir Putin, who's a KGB thug. And we need to recognize that's what he is, and I think most of us do. Uh, you could talk about cyber, which we'll talk about today, I hope, because that's very important. Uh, but uh, at the end of the day, we both agreed China is the greatest threat that we face and the greatest concern that we have to, have to be willing to to confront, and I, when I say confront, by the way, I don't mean in a military way, I just mean nationally we have to prioritize such that we can be effective in that. So uh, appreciate the conversation because I think it's important. And once again, Dutch, thanks for sharing Yeah, it's great to be here too. Again. Four minutes, 47 seconds, that was a little short, so. <laughs> Beautiful. I'll, I'll do it in two minutes. Okay. Yeah, yeah. First thing, it's great to be here uh, and to communicate about issues that are important to our country and the world. Uh, we're going to focus on China today, but it is a very dangerous world there. Um, I'm happy to be here uh, with, with your organization. Um, you know, we've met before and, and we help fund you. Uh, and uh, Chris and I both are appropriators also. And um, what, uh, as far as Chris is concerned, Congress has a lot of issues and problems, a lot of bipartisan issues. And if we're going to do what we need to do for the benefit of our constituents and our country, we're going to have to work a lot better and a lot more together. And I can say this, those of us who specialize in national security do work a lot closer. Chris and I got to be, be uh, very close. We travel together. Uh, we do a lot of traveling. I've been to 60 different countries, and it's not Bermuda either. Iraq, Afghanistan, Pakistan, China, Russia, those different areas. And when you go and you get to learn who individuals are, you learn to respect them. And, you know, uh, Chris, uh, Chris's reputation for being fair, for doing his homework and being involved is there, and I respect being on the stage with you, with you also. He, I, he won't say it, but I think he did win a... Uh, an award for traveling around the world the fastest. Is that the case? Why don't you say what that is so I don't have to say it for the, you? Uh, I have the world's record for the fastest nonstop flight around the world. Okay, there you go. So that's a big deal. Yeah. And we, that was yeah. a lot more fun than being in Congress. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I tell you, 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 you got to have tough skin. You know that. Uh, the other thing um, that, that Chris has done, he and his brother have written some novels which I've read, and they're excellent. So he's a very special person and the type that we want to come together and communicate, and hopefully in the next Congress, and we don't know where it's going to be or what's going to happen, that we can continue. We will work together, but it should be about our country first, and that's where, where we're, we're trying to go. Some of the issues today, these are the most dangerous times in the world, and it's, it's, it's Iraq, it's Afghanistan, it's uh, North Korea, it's, it's Iran, um, it's, it's ISIS. Um, it's the China-Russia threat. I mean, there are so many threats that are out there, and, and we have to deal with them. Uh, it's, it's the military threat, especially as it relates to China. China has money. They're growing. They're going to the moon. They're active in space and cyber and hypersonic weapons. And in order to be able to counter this and to make sure we, we maintain our democracy and our quality of life, we have to be able to show that we're in a position to protect our country, to protect our democracy and, and the things that we do. And that's what our ultimate goal should be. Those of us who specialize, uh, I'm on defense appropriations, and we've gotten one of the biggest defense budgets because for a period of time in our country, we had a bill called sequestration, which cuts everything across the board. And you know, if you, anyone in budgeting or has managed a company or whatever knows that budgeting is about priorities. It's not about cutting things across the board. Well, the last two years, we have been able not to follow that law, we, and, and, and we're doing well, and we're doing things that we need, need to do on both sides of the aisle. So uh, we're going to get a lot more into issues such as cyber, I think, in the questions, and you know, I'll hold for that. Um, I'm going to have to leave on time. Chris can stay. Um, I have a classified hearing. I'm going from China to Russia uh, on our election, and I have to be there. At, at, at about 12.15 or 12.20. So if I run out of here, it's not because I don't like you or I'm afraid of you or whatever, <laughs> but it's because, you know, I have to go to another hearing. That's what happens in Congress. Yeah. So thanks for having us here. Well, thank you And both. we appreciate what you do. What a 
beautiful building, too. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and we really appreciate you both taking the time to be here. We know things are busy right now up on the Hill. But let's jump right in. And you've both mentioned some of the critical threats. Um, we've seen, in particular, a, renew, a, a new uh, Chinese focus on building up their military. Um, from the South China Sea to acquisition of new Russian weapons. They've put much more money into various of their systems. What, what is the implication for that um, for us with our alliances, uh, both in the Pacific and implications more globally for our national security? You want me to go Coach, first? Your, yeah. Um, <clears throat> yeah, coincidentally, I spent about three hours down at the Defense Intelligence Agency last week, actually the week before. Uh, looking at uh, the new generation of weapon systems, some from Russia, but primarily from China. And, uh, you know, if you, <laughs> several of you have been to Africa or third world countries, I'm sure, and developing countries. And it's interesting because you'll see people there who hold a cell phone who never held a landline, never had a regular phone in their, right. in their home. And they skipped a generation. They just went directly to cell phone, and in fact, not just a cell phone, but a sophisticated smartphone. And China has done much the same thing in weapons development. They have been able to skip not just one generation, in some cases two or three or four generations, fourth generation fighter being a good example of it, where uh, you know, 10 years ago, 20 years ago, they had very little capability, in some cases no capability in that. And, and, and less uh, emphasis overall. Yeah, it wasn't their priority, system. exactly. And their, and their priority was on their PLA, the, the People's Liberation Army, mm -hmm. the soldiers. And they've had a, a dramatic shift in that. So now I'll make that point second, but completing this point. We can't look at them and say they're backwards in their development of weapons. It's just not true. Now, unfortunately, uh, much of that technology was stolen from the West. And, uh, and that's just a fact. It just was. Uh, and shame on us for, uh, so, for so, so for easily allowing them to do that. But, but we weren't as diligent as we could have been. So the first thing is that, that they are recommitted, that they're skipping generations, that the weapons that they're developing are, are, are very, very capable and in some ways better than ours. The second thing is their re-emphasis, the redirection of those weapons, what matters to them. Uh, you know, we're not going to invade China with conventional forces. What's far more likely is we find ourselves in, in a sea battle with China, and they recognize that. And so they're redirecting a lot of that increased uh, capabilities towards their, their navy and protecting their region and being the dominant player in the region. And one good example of that is hypersonic. And I'll end on this, because I don't want to talk too long and give Dutch, who's you know, more knowledgeable on this than maybe I might be. But once again, the hypersonic missile system is one example, and it's only one example, but it's a good one. And I remember talking with Admiral Harris again about, you know, this takes off our aircraft carriers. It takes them off the board, one of the foundations of our national security strategy. And he said something interesting to me, and I kind of hate to quote him on that, and so I'm going to speak more generally, but, you know, he disagreed. He said it doesn't take uh, our carriers off the board. And I said, well, would you, would you lose one of your carriers? Or would you put a carrier under threat? And he said, well, we would have to. Well, what an event that would be if we lost a carrier due to one of their missiles, and they have very extensive capabilities in that. So it, it complicates our strategy enormously with, uh, with some of the reemphasis of, of their weapon systems. Again, we, I could go on, but I want, I want well, to that's okay. a chance. I could yeah. just say ditto. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Do, you, do you want to add yeah, Well, yeah. I, I think if you look at China and their focus, uh, they are focusing to be the most powerful country in the world. I think their goal is their 100th anniversary, which is 2040. And um, we have to make sure that we maintain our superiority to protect our quality of life, our democracy, the things that we believe in. Um, that doesn't mean that we're, that we're going to stop China or Russia or other countries from trying to develop their own weapons, but it's serious. One of the things that, that Chris, you talked about was that a lot of what China has received, uh, and it's worth billions of dollars, is they've stolen for many, many years. Uh, a lot of our technology, because we years ago weren't where we are now as far as cybersecurity. And, and they have focused on space as an example. And they're going to the moon. Now, the good news, we've been to the moon, and uh, you know, we, we raised the flag, took the pictures and all that. Uh, we're going back to the moon the next time, uh, hopefully, uh, without man, because we're going to do research and that type of thing. But when you, ha when you control the skies, uh, sometimes you you control the world. You know, when we became so powerful in this country, uh, there was years ago, Russia put up something called Sputnik, and it really worried the United States. 
So at that point, JFK was the president, and he put, put billions of dollars in investments, and we became you know, the, the superiority in space. And space just isn't about having satellites looking down. It's GPS. It's so many different things that, that we do and deal with space. And yet China and Russia right now are up there with us. And so we have to maintain where we are. Uh, China right now uh, is, is investing a tremendous amount of money. And again, getting back to them stealing information from us. Um, I used to say about ten, seven, eight years ago in speeches, China's stealing from us. They're stealing a lot of money. I'd say they're stealing $10 billion. I hate to say this, folks, but right now, the amount of money that China has been stealing from our country, uh, even fertilizer companies, because they're in the fertilizer business, is $600 billion. That's a lot of money. And that's what we have to deal with, and we have to let China know sooner this has got to stop. And you know, we, we all are in the cyber business, but we in the United States don't steal products from other country. And that's got to be a standard that, it's, that we have to stand by and is strong. China needs, needs to know that. Um, you know, the aircraft carrier issue. We have the best aircraft carriers in the world, and they're awesome. 5,000 people, and a lot of it's classified what they do, but you have an aircraft carrier, ask Iran, you know, outside of your country. Uh, the, the, the jets that we use in the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan come off of those aircraft carriers. And China is now developing their first aircraft carriers. The good news, unless they steal more from us, uh, they're not going to be able to be as sophisticated as we are for probably the, the, the next 10 years. Uh, but it gives us the opportunity to, to, to do the things we need to do. And I said in the opening statement, sequestration really hurt our military. And when the military, like Chris will tell you this, when they get an order, they have to yes, sir, no, sir. And when they get these budgets that aren't where they need to be, it, it puts us behind. And the good news, now we have the budgets moving forward as long as we can maintain our bipartisan relationship uh, in the future. And can, on this issue of the threat, this is a lot of it due to the hacking, the IP theft, um, those kinds of, of methods, mm -hmm. right? Yes. Yep, and do you, do you see those methods evolving in ways that we're able to keep up with? Every day, you have to stay ahead of the technology. Every day. Yeah. Um, you know, I do. I do a lot of the cyber. I actually represent NSA, so I deal with a lot of cyber issues. And by the way, folks, in the United States of America, NSA is not listening to you illegally. They have standards that, that are a lot stronger than people know. They probably do more to help our country in getting information and intelligence, dealing with these threats from Russia, China, Iran, Iraq, Afghanistan, ISIS. And, and that's very important and very relevant. So, and that gets even back to our schools. And, to develop STEM education and to make sure that future generations are challenged and stay where we need to be to stay ahead of the threat of a Russia and China. Because again, China, uh, China is known to be aggressive in the intelligence community and spying. They have more spies probably in the world than anybody else. And they do more hacking than probably anyone else. But the thing that bothers me, uh, they, are, they are stealing all of this information. Um, we, we don't anticipate a destructive attack with China. Oh my gosh, we owe China close to a trillion dollars. And, and so China is just looking to grow and, and, and to gain influence. And that's what they're doing and that's what they're trying to do. Um, well, let, me, let me turn to a, a piece of legislation. Before we go on, can I? Yes. Very quickly on this. Because yes. <clears throat> I want to conclude with the military and then uh, piggyback on what the Dutch is talking about there. A couple things to understand about the military, and, and this is good. Uh, president Xi promised our president in 2015 when they were expanding these atolls in the South China Sea, as they were doing, he promised us, he promised our president, we will not militarize these. And immediately after that, they did. And they have very effectively. Uh, and they've essentially expanded their, their territory and region of influence very effectively because of that, which is why it's so important just yesterday for us to you know, maintain the reality that this is not Chinese territory. These are international waters, international airspace. You had B-52s flying to, through contested areas, the ADAs, Air Defense Identification Zone. And we have to state that clearly now and not waver on that. We're not going to concede uh, you know, hundreds of, of millions of acres of, of, of water and air to China just because they've made this claim that this, these are international waters, international airspace. We have to be firm on that. 
And then the second thing that the Dutch we kind of transitioned to, and that's the cyber, and I'll just say that very quickly. One of the great uh, challenges we have is, and, and a good example of is Project Maven, where we are uh, spending a, a boatload of money, uh, and I'll, that's a very scientific term, <laughs> very uh, precise. but a, very, a boatload of money on, on our own artificial intelligence efforts to stay in the lead on that. And look, the United States, for whatever reason, our culture, we are the creative genius of the world. We have this creative spark that other countries just can't quite mimic, but that's just not enough. We have to have a committed and, and, a, and a fiduciary responsibility to being the lead on this, because China very clearly wants to be the leader on artificial intelligence, which then makes their cyber and all of these other capabilities so much more threatening. With a lot of government support and investment. Oh, you know, on the on, on the, this on the uh, artificial intelligence yeah, by on, the Chinese. Yeah, uh, by the Chinese, and we have to. That's a government function as well. We can't rely on the market alone to do that. We have to direct and also facilitate that. So I wanted to uh, get to a piece of legislation that you've been very instrumental um, in passing, which is the Committee of Foreign Investment in the U.S., yeah. known as CFIUS, yeah. to those in the know, which um, reviews foreign investment in U.S. businesses that might pose national security yeah. uh, threats. So tell us what CFIUS is, why it's important, and why these reforms are so important. I'd be curious. I won't make people raise their hand, yeah. but I'd be curious if I said, how many of you know what CFIUS is and how do you do that? Well, go ahead. How many of you who, know Who knows? That's surprising. That's surprising. This is an number. educated audience. Yeah, there. you, Good you job. really are because most people, even in even in uh, you know our area of work, don't. So this Committee on Foreign Investment in the U.S. essentially it's regulation that you know goes back to the '70s, stating we need to protect our national security. When we have foreign investment, there are national security, uh, security overlaps there that we need to be aware of and, and be able to control in some circumstances. Well, the regulatory effort there and the capabilities just simply were insufficient. I mean, by a vast margin. And we've been trying for several years now to upgrade, up, update that. We did so recently with a, a, a bill called FIRMA, which is another version of CFIUS. But I've always argued, and I think this is such a critical point, I don't think China or Russia or any other nation can destroy us. I don't believe that. But I think that we can commit suicide. And that's essentially what we're doing in some ways by assisting China and our adversaries in having a powerful position over us. And so you've had something like a 700% increase in Chinese investment in high tech, very sensitive industries in the last few years. And we did that without adequate oversight. And so FIRMA, or the new version of CFIUS, allows a greater resources and a greater authority to go in and look at some of these investments and say, are we selling very sensitive national security secrets to China for, for nothing but money and the financial uh, benefits of that. And it allows us to have a much broader and a much, uh, a much more involved review of some of those transactions. And I could give you many, many examples of it, but I don't need to. You can imagine yourself. If you have a chip maker that has a very proprietary, very important element that is essential to our national security, they shouldn't be partnered with a Chinese company that will then have access and steal that technology. And this had bipartisan support. Absolutely, it was a great CFIUS. example. And Chris is considered an expert in CFIUS. He, he really knows and is focused on that. Uh, let me tell you an example of how I was involved. When I was the ranking member on the Intelligence Committee and my uh, co-chair, the chair, Mike Rogers, and I uh, did an investigation on Huawei and ZTE, uh, two, two of the, probably the largest telecom companies in China and in the world. And they were uh, in our country and they were attempting to grow and wanted to put their infrastructure in our country. And we got very concerned uh, because of the way it was happening and that they didn't, weren't going to grow <clears throat> pursuant to our standards, which would protect our citizens. Anyone, the way we saw it, who had um, <clears throat> their, this technology, that allowed the Chinese government to be able to, to, to listen and see and, and get information on what we were doing. We had an open hearing, and the head of, head of uh, Huawei uh, and ZTE um, I asked a question. I said, you know, you're in a Chinese country. Uh, whatever in the end your government says, that's what you have to do, even if you're president or chairman of a major company like, like Huawei. And if your, your leadership tells you when you're in our country and you're selling your equipment to our citizens, we want you to get information, you deny them, you could go to jail. And these are the, the, these are the issues that, that we were dealing with. And that really upset Huawei and ZTE to the point where uh, I visited the founder, which most people 
don't know him, he doesn't come out a lot, the founder of Huawei. And we met in Hong Kong, and we had, it was like a deposition for me, asking questions, and, and they refused really to work with us. Now we know that it's a global economy, we know there's competition, but when it comes to protecting our security interests, our number one priority is what's best for our country. And we felt very strongly the way that they were attempting to grow was wrong and it would, it, it would really put us in a bad situation. And Huawei was in England and England was having those problems. So we work with Australia and, and Mike Rogers and I uh, publicly because when you're on the intelligence committee, you, you can't charge. But we went on 60 Minutes and we told about the threat on Huawei and ZTE. And um, as a result, they didn't go forward. Well, years later, they've come back and they want, want to come back in and to an extent they have. One thing that just concerned me recently, though, is that uh, they were selling some of our technology that was in their equipment, and they were selling that to Iran and also to North Korea. And the good news is that uh, President Trump that put sanctions. We had strong sanctions with Congress on them because of that. But then all of a sudden, a month later, our president takes those sanctions off. Now, I'm not going to get into any politics or whatever, but you know, you, you have to have reasons for doing things. And so at this point, uh, they're aggressively, Huawei and ZTE are trying to come back in our country. We, we're, we're trying to make sure we, we stop them unless they do it pursuant to our standards. So military aggression, IP threat, cyber aggression. Yeah. Um, we've been talking about a lot of the, the threats. Um, China's obviously seeking to be a global power. Do you see bright spots in the relationship? Do you see places where our interests align such that we could identify constructive ways of working together for, for common goals? I'll defer to the oh, you're senior member. Defer to me. yeah. Okay, I'm a Democrat. Let's talk about the environment. <laughs> I think China has a very serious problem. Have you, anybody here been to China? And you, you know the smog, how serious it is. And they have realized, I think after the Olympics, that they had to do, when they had the Olympics, that they had to do something. So I think we have a lot of common interests. And China probably has more cars than any other country in the world. And they have our cars. For some reason, they like Buicks. <laughs> but uh, um, that's that a bad comment about Buick. They just like have a lot of Buicks there. But you know we have we we have. That's what you call a backpedal. Well, uh, <laughs> look, I have a, I have a, a GMC, so they're the same line. They're they're family. Anyhow, getting back to the issue, um, you know you 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 have a situation where if we can work together and because of, of good minds, you know China uh, graduates a lot more engineers than we do. Now I will say this that our our institutions and our universities are considered to be superior. And so, and we have an upper hand. A lot of Chinese people who have a lot of money want their children to come to the United States and their programs to do that. And I don't think that's a bad thing as long as they're there for the right reason. What we ha have, to, have to, to deal with though um, is to make sure that they're not stealing information and using it to our disadvantage. Another area is infrastructure. I mean, infrastructure is something that we have to meet moving forward. It creates a lot of jobs. And again, China has, has invested about $175 billion in our country. And we have a debt to them close, uh, you know, close to, what is it, $100 billion now? Or what was, I've got my figure in there. And, and because we owe them money, we should work together. Uh, I think there's no question China is going to be strong. They're powerful. They're educating their population. So we always will have to be there together in this earth. And the more that we can work together with them and develop these issues, and the more we can let them know that in our standards, you don't steal. We don't steal from you. You gotta stop this stealing. And when we can work these issues out, and, and I, I give President Trump credit for calling these issues out as far as, you know, stop doing the things that are disadvantaged to our country. We need a more level playing field. And that's what we really have to do in our relationship with China. Before we turn to the audience questions. Um, what, what do you see as China's long-term objective? Hmm. Well, that's a great question. That is the question in many ways. And I would actually kind of build a foundation for that by, again, piggybacking on some things that Dutch has said. Um, I don't think China is full of bad people no. at all. 
I think uh, if you'll allow a personal observation I, or personal belief, I think we are all children of the same God, regardless of where you live, or where, what your culture is, and that most people are good people. So in these expressing my concerns, I don't mean to indicate China's bad, bad people. I don't believe that at all. But Chinese leadership has a very different view uh, of, of their values than, than U.S. Uh, does, I believe. They're not a democracy. Um, <clears throat> President Xi isn't going to step aside. Either. They don't have free and fair elections. They don't value human dignity the same way that, that we do, I believe. And so I think we have to look at them through a prism of they're not bad people. And we need to find areas that we can agree and accommodate. But on the other hand, they view the world very differently than we do. And that's just truth. So how do we work within that framework? Um, and, and the second thing now coming to your question now, what are Chinese goals and ambitions? Well, they're very clear on that. It's not a, it's not a secret. If you want to understand it, go read Made in China 2025 which is their, uh, their goal, which they're methodically achieving and by and large have achieved, and that is to be independent of any Western technology for anything that they need to have, to have had all the, through whatever means uh, uh, necessary that they've used to be able to manufacture and produce anything essential to their economy, their infrastructure, their military. And uh, they've, they've done that very effectively. And then if you want to know what their real long-term goals are beyond that, read One Belt, One Road which is, uh, you know, 100th anniversary of the creation of the Communist Party in China in 2048. And, and it describes very, very simply their, I don't want to say ambition, because it's more than ambition, but because it's a methodical plan that, again, they're effectively carrying out to be not just the dominant influence in the region, but to be the dominant influence in the world. And, uh, and I think that they're committed to that. I think that that is their intention. I think they view that as their right as a rising, as a rising power. And the question we come down to is this, and I've, had, I've actually had the chance to ask President Xi and other ministers this question, the thicketies, the thicketies trap that we're all familiar with, and I've heard that pronounced differently, and so if I did it wrong, forgive me. Uh, but it is this idea, going back to you know, ancient Greek philosopher, can a rising power and an established power as, they, as one rises, will they come into conflict? And history shows us that they almost always do, about 80% of the time. And our challenge is it's to avoid that and to be able to have China rise, which they will, and I understand that, and I'm not saying they shouldn't. But can we do it in such a way that we value human rights, value democracy, value Western uh, priorities, and not come into a military conflict as a result of that? Well, and since we're at the US Institute of Peace, who, with the yep. mission of, uh, Preventing and resolving violent conflict, that, yeah. is, that is the critical question. But let me build on what you just said with the first question from our audience, uh, which is, do you believe the true goal of China in Africa is to acquire natural resources uh, or to position itself in Africa to access uh, space for China and create uh, for cyber and create an orbit to fulfill their political and economic goals? All of the above. I mean, mm -hmm. China is growing and they want to be the dominant power in the world. Their goal in 2040, I think with their 100th anniversary. Uh, what they're doing is that they're building uh, structures all over the world, Africa. Uh, they just built a port in Djibouti. Anybody been to Djibouti? It's not much, but it's near Ethiopia, but it's on the water where ports are. Um, they're, they're trying to get resources. You know, China's you know, a huge population, and, and they're, they're attempting to get resources. But what they're doing is they're going to these governments that, that don't have any money, and, and they're lending them the money. They're building uh, community centers, government buildings, that type of thing, and then these governments default. And then China comes in, and they have more power. They come to the, uh, to the monetary fund to, to bail them out, but when they bail them out, uh, China then owns these properties. And we, we really have to stand up, especially in Africa and what's happening. That is their style. Uh, and, and you talked about China generally. The Chinese people are good people. I, I've been involved with some Chinese people throughout my career. I had a relationship with a, a family uh, whose, whose father was the last governor of the Shanghai province. They're not alive anymore. And, and her husband was a, 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 sh a shipping company. And um, they had to flee uh, when the communists took over, and they flee to Taiwan, where, where a lot of those, those Chinese. And 
But I learned a lot about the history and, and the Chinese culture and, and how pride the Chinese people are. And you know, everyone in the end wants to have a home, to be able to raise their family, to be able to eat, to have safety and those type of things. Uh, but because of the, I guess the Chinese government that took over, um, they, they had so many people, I guess they felt this is the way we're gonna have to manage our country. But then it grew and grew and grew. And you know, to this day, we love our democracy. We like our freedoms, our freedom of speech, and all these things. And that's not what China stands for. And if we don't continue to grow our military, to be strong, to deal with the issues of cyber and all these threats that we have, you know, where will the world be? And I do want to say this, and this is really serious. We have a lot of issues. When I, when I was on the Gang of Eight in intelligence, people would say, what keeps you up at night? And I'd say, well, spicy Mexican food, that, that does it. <laughs> um, but number two, probably the most serious threat is, is nuclear weapons. If China, Russia, or the United States get into a nuclear war, the earth is over as we know it. We still have the capability to stop uh, uh, Iran or North Korea, but those three countries have to, have to work through peace in order not, not for this to occur, but uh, the, the nuclear weapons. But, but then you get into the cyber realm, and the cyber realm is so serious because it touches everybody, everything, anywhere. And if we don't start developing standards, and it's going to be tough for, um, for our country uh, to come together, and especially, we're not talking China, we're talking China and Russia, to start dealing with this sophistication of cyber. Because we talk about our privacy, there's no privacy when you're getting hacked all the time. Well, let, let me build on something that both of you have said, and that is um, there have been an number of comments that say basically China has been a free rider on the international system. They've benefited from the, the, the set of norms and institutions that currently guide the world. How do you see that as a leverage point or an opportunity um, in dealing with China's interests and the transgressions that you've just identified? <laughs> I, I want to make sure I understand the question. Very quickly, I want to add one thing to Dutch, and he's exactly right. You go all through Africa, developing countries, you see ports, airports, roads, community centers, wide range of things. China's not doing that out of compassion or charity. They're doing it because it's in their national interest strategically, and they are very clear that it remains within their national interest, and we need to you know, appreciate that that's their incentives there. And I'm sorry, Nancy, tell me, I, I'm not sure I understand well, the question. <clears throat> You've both talked about the importance of, of maintaining our democratic systems, the values that have informed it, that have informed our international engagements. Um, there have been a number of, of characterizations of China's uh, having been a free rider on that system, yeah. that they've gained a lot from that system without contributing or arguably respecting some of those values and norms. Do you see that, how do you see that unfolding in the future if China continues to rise, threaten that system, um, or not respect it, particularly related to the considerable investments they're making around the world in Africa and elsewhere? Yeah, well, again, uh, you have to understand what China's gonna do, what is in China leadership's interest, not what's in the world's interest, not what's in Africa's, and not what's necessarily in Chinese middle class or Chinese workers' interest. And uh, we have facilitated the rise and the ability of them to integrate themselves into a, the, the new century. That we, we laid that foundation in the 70s. But if you want to know how China is going to react to a global governance, look how they treat their own people. And that's all, you have to, that's all you have to know, is how do they treat their own people? Do they allow them the freedom or do they repress their freedoms? Do they allow them the ability to speak, move, say, get educated, and travel internationally, or do they repress those? And, and, very, and, and you know, many people look at China and they think, well, they're just like us. They're just kind of a, a different form of democracy. And in fact, if you go to leaders around Africa or developing nations, I mean, they have this choice before them. They look at China and go, well, it seems to be working out for them. They're rising, they're, they're bringing their poor into middle class, they seem to be functioning government, there's not a lot of chaos. And then frankly, they look at us and go, holy cow, you know, look at the chaos, look at democracy is messy. It's emotional, it's, you know, it's not, not a smooth road, uh, and there's a lot of bumps along the way. And you know, they're given with this choice, and we have to remind them, yeah, democ democracy is messy, and it's, and it's chaotic sometimes, but look at the outcome we give versus this smooth transition of having a very hierarchical position and power 
which doesn't value and doesn't reward human dignity and human innovation and, uh, and those things that we consider foundational to everything that we believe. And this is why so many people from China uh, who come here to work want to come here because of the freedoms and liberties that we have versus some of the, the things that happen in their country and the oppression and big government with you everywhere. So uh, here's, a, here's a question from Twitter. Uh, what impact do you think the the Trump's? No. <laughs> <laughs> Someone this, else. This will be in interesting. Question from Twitter. Uh, what impact do you think the U.S.-China trade wars will have on China's neighbors? Hmm. Here we go. Yeah, I don't know. Well, uh, if we are engaged in a long-term strategic committed, to use that term, trade war with China, we will win that. They have more to lose on this than we do, but it's going to be, there's going to be casualties along the way. I've had more conversations about this over the last six months than any other single subject with constituents back home. Everyone from shepherds, farmers, ranchers, to high-tech imaging, to cyber, to you know, uh, chip makers. I mean, there's a wide range of people who are affected and troubled by this, as am I generally, because I'm a free trader, I'm a conservative. I believe that free trade is one of the foundations for conservative thought. Uh, so there are, uh, although I appreciate and understand the president's goals, and it's not just economic for him, it's much more than that. It's national security and it's, and it's fair trade. But there are people who are paying a price, and some of those will be uh, so the neighbors around China, because then, and I'll, I can conclude that with this thought, they have a choice, and they can look at the region and say, well, will you be here looking at the U.S.? Will you be here? Can we count on you? And both, uh, both from a, a uh, diplomatic military uh, position, but also from an economic position, which is why the failure of the Trans-Pacific Partnership was a very meaningful event, because many of them looked and said, you guys aren't committed to the region economically, therefore we're compelled to partner with China, even though they may not want to, and that's the end result for this. You have neighbors around China who will then be compelled to partner with China, even though they may not want to, because they do not know if we're committed to the region or not. And it's bad for them in almost every way if they're compelled to do that. We're going down a dangerous road with trade. Um, I think we've had a punch, counter punch. I believe that what the president was trying to do, but I believe he also doesn't have a lot of sophistication in that area. He was trying to say, China, what you're doing is not fair. And you know, the, the monetary issues and all of that. And he caught it on the table. Okay, in trade war, he punched, they punched, he punched. And eventually, they've got to stop punching and start talking because it's going to affect the whole world economy uh, because of the United States and China, and we are such major powers. And I think if we get some reasonable heads together, maybe we, we should be able to work it out. But if we can bring China to the table, because some of the things that they were doing were not fair, it was outrageous. They were taking advantage of a lot of things happening in our country. So let's see where it goes. Uh, there are a lot of issues out there, but trade, when it, when it affects your pocketbook, I know right now they, the farmers are having a serious problem and, and because of how it's going to affect them. And, the, and they're, not as, they don't, they're not as concerned, the ones I've talked to, about Russia as they are about their own pocketbooks. And once that message gets out, hopefully we'll take this a lot more serious, get some of the best minds we have in this country on trade. And, and resolve the issue. And just in 30 seconds, this is something we had to do. As uncomfortable as it is, we could not go the next generation and not have, as Dutch mm. said, and not have fair trade between, and it's not just China, by the way. EU is the same way. Yeah. Uh, and, so we're, and so the president reset that. It's painful. Uh, there are some things that make me very uncomfortable, but strategically, we had to confront it at some point. Yes. So we may as well do it now and get it, on the, get it out of the way. So uh, Let's get the experts involved now who know, know this, this science. Yeah. So I have a couple of questions that are essentially, um, President Trump said yesterday that there isn't any evidence that China is interfering in our election. You know, we just talked a lot about cyber aggression in different ways. Have you seen any evidence on this? Is this an issue that, you know, we, we're, a lot of focus is on Russia's interference with our election. Is this, is this an issue with China? Are you saying the president said there wasn't evidence or did he say that Without. There was? Oh, without evidence, he claimed that there was. Yeah. yeah. Well, I think without he, evidence, I think he has evidence, but isn't able to cite that. Some of this is classified too. Yeah. Um, you okay. know, look, China's philosophy in the intelligence world is volume. They probably have more spies out there in the world than anyone else. They do more hacking than any any other country, and um, 
So they're, they're going to get whatever they can get for leverage or to, whichever to their benefit. The focal point now is Russia, no question. And, you know, hopefully when Mueller finishes the investigation, we'll get the facts. All this back and forth, we need to get the facts, and then we can move forward. Yeah. And, and so as far as China, sure, China's going to be all over everything we do because they attack us all the time. And that's, that's, a, that's a problem. And I don't, you know, we're, we're, I, I think President Xi understands that's an issue with us, and we're going to have to make it a bigger issue. Because down the world, I, other than nuclear weapons, this is m probably one of the most serious threats. Because when you can knock someone's infrastructure, water, electricity, I mean, these are things that can happen if we, if we, we don't get control of cyber security. And, and Nancy, look, this doesn't, you don't have to have a top secret security briefing to know the answer to this question. How could you assume that China's going to attack or probe virtually everywhere but not probe in our election in our election mm -hmm. process, whether it's voting machines or voter registration, whatever. How could you possibly believe that they would do everything else but not do that? Of course, they're going to try and do that. And, and by the way, it's not just China and Russia; it's North Korea and Iran and, and a lot of other people as and well. And we talk about Russia's propaganda. China has a huge propaganda machine, yeah. and that's part of what they do. And yeah. So let's wind up with. Um, sort of a big question, and you can bring up any topics that you feel like we haven't addressed, but when you think about our relationship with China in 10 to 20 years from now, what do you think is likely, what do you think is, is um, optimal? Well, I'll go first and I'll let the more senior member conclude, because he's smarter and wiser and better looking. I, I just so. want to clean up what you're saying. That's yeah. <laughs> um, I, I would go back, at very, again, very foundational. China's not full of bad people. The China leadership has a very different view of the future than we do. And as long as we look at it through a realistic prism, I'm not, I'm not predicting doom, but I'm, I'm suggesting the U.S. has to be firm. And the U.S. has to be committed to a relationship that uh, recognizes the realities of, of what China's values and the values of their leadership are. As long as we're able to do that, just like we did with the former Soviet Union, we coexisted with them, we didn't end up destroying each other, and eventually one, uh, one system was accepted as uh, you know, a, a desired outcome for, for most of the world, and one was not. I think that's likely to be the outcome here, but we have to manage a real difficult path forward as, as, we, as we walk through that minefield. Okay, well, as far as China's concerned, where we go, it's up to the, to, the, to the leadership and hopefully people like Chris and I, who, I mean, I know I've been to China four times and when, when they weren't happy with me about Huawei or GTE, and then I was over in China and had a banquet with them. So, you know, if, if we, it's about trust in relationships. We're competing. It's just like an athletic contest. You can compete. When the game's over, you know, then you work together. And the more that we have, and we have a lot of Chinese people who've come to the United States, who've gone to our universities, and want to stay here a lot. And the, the more that we can learn about each other and, and where we are and what we want. But we cannot agree on the civil liberty issues that go on in China, the fact that the people are oppressed in certain areas. That's not who we are. We can't agree to that. Whether we can resolve that, I don't know. But I think the more that we deal with them and the environment and economic development, if you can, if you can work business, China has money. So a lot of people want China's money to do infrastructure, to build things that we don't want to spend the money or we don't want to raise taxes to spend the money. And that's where, where we need to go. And, and because it's such a superpower, and I think Chinese people are good people. I mean, the people that I've known and relationships that I have in the Chinese community are super. I, they're honest, most of them. I'm not saying their government is, not at all. I don't trust their government at all. But I think the people themselves are, are unique and, 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 and want the same things that, that we want. We're, we could, if we could work with China on cyber standards, if we could work with China on space again, where are we going in space? There are things we could share and work together. And we're really sharing the United States because we have a lot of Chinese people that are going to our universities, learning our standards, learning you know, what we know about space and, and everything that we do, whether it's the economy. So I, I hope for the benefit of the world and for our grandchildren, we always like to say that in politics, that that we can keep moving forward with, with those relationships. And that's where your organization comes in. To try to not always talk about how tough and big and strong we are. We, hate, we need to be there. Or, or world history shows you can be attacked or taken over. But it's the personal relationships of trust. It's the relationship that Chris and I have. Two different parties. Our parties aren't getting along. We work together. We can talk together. We might disagree. But I don't hate him because he disagrees with me or vice versa. Yeah, thank you, Dutch. Mm -hmm. 
I want to thank both of you for joining us sure. here today for your focus on a critical issue with a lot of complexity, uh, fraught with uh, opportunities and, and uh, significant problems. I appreciate um, the leadership that you bring, including to complex issues, um, and uh, for showing us that this bipartisan spirit in Congress is, is alive and making progress on critical national security interests. Right. Well, good. So, Please good join me here. in thanking our, our Congressman Ruppersberger and Congressman Stewart. Chris and I go to a lot of events. It's 12 o'clock and we're over. That's great. Is that good time? job. <laughs> uh, that good. We got okay. the warning from our, uh, okay. <laughs> our aviator here. Yes. Thank you, everybody, Take care. for joining Bye -bye. us. <laughs> <laughs>